This is episode 355 of JumbleThink. T minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Welcome to JumbleThink, where we interview dreamers, makers, innovators, and influencers all about their journey of turning dreams and ideas into reality. Along the way, we're going to give you some tips on how you can turn your own dreams and ideas into reality, too. On the show today, it's 10 questions with Mike. Well, that's me, your host. So it's going to be a lot of fun. Whether you're a new listener or a longtime fan, if you've never subscribed to the show, head on over to wherever you listen to podcasts, search for JumbleThink, and click that magical subscribe button. If you head on over to JumbleThink.com, you'll find links to Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Pandora, and more. So head on over and subscribe to the show. Now let's join today's conversation. Hey there, friends. Welcome to Jumble Think. My name's Michael Woodward. I am your host. We have a fun show lined up for you today. We haven't done this in a long time, but I'm going to be answering real questions asked of me on Quora, something that we did, oh, months and months ago. I'm also going to give you a little bit of an update here on the things happening at Jumble Think and some exciting things we are working on. Before we dive into the conversation, though, today, I want to thank our friends over at Floxy for sponsoring today's show. Floxy can help you with graphic design, web development, and even video editing. Best of all, as a listener of JumbleThink, they want to give you 10% off your first month. All you have to do is head on over to Floxy, F-L-O-C-K-S-Y dot com slash JumbleThink to get that 10% off your first month. Really cool service doing great things. I think you're going to love what they can create for you. Today on the show, we are changing it up. It's been a while since we've done this, but over the last several years, we do these standalone episodes where I sit down and share some insights, some ideas, some thoughts to help you on the journey of chasing dreams and ideas. And it's been way too long since I've done that. Today, we're taking and doing a variant on it. I'm taking some questions from Quora, some other questions that have been emailed to me. I'm throwing it together. I'm answering those questions. Hopefully, some of them will inspire you to dream. Some of them will give you an insight into more of me and my thoughts. And other questions are just simply a lot of fun. Today on the show, we are changing it up. It's been way too long since we've done a standalone episode. Now, standalone episodes here at Jumble Think, if you've never caught one, can look vastly different. It could be diving deep into a specific topic maybe about micro experiments or the importance of chasing your dreams. And we get really deep into what that means and looks like. Today, though, we're doing one of the other standalone episodes, which I love. We're not having a guest on. I am answering questions both from Quora, from listeners, from a whole bunch of different sources. These are things that have been asked of me in the last couple months. And I wanted to give you those answers It's a wide range of questions. Some of them have to do with your dreams and ideas. Some of them have to be, uh, happen to be focused on the world around us right now with COVID and with some of the protests going on. I'm going to cover a lot of ground, but these are a lot of fun. I'm going to answer some of those questions. Before I do that, I want to give you an update on some things happening at JumbleThink. It's been a wild few weeks. It's been, well, a wild few months. I, for the first time in, couple of months, went on a little trip, flew out to California last Thursday. And a um, friend of mine called me up and said, Hey, Mike, do you want to come out and help Cal Fire with, with their live stream? And so came out to Cal Fire's fire that they're managing on the East Bay of San Francisco. That is like the second largest wildfire in California history. It's crazy. It's been a lot of fun to be able to help with the live stream, get them uh, set up so that they can better s- send out the word of what's going on and and enabling them to communicate better. And I'm here for a little bit longer. I'm recording this on the road. It is literally Monday, August 31st at 9.03 p.m. on the West Coast. I'm recording this and, and then uh, sharing it with you on Tuesday. I've also on the show had the honor of having some crazy cool guests. Two weeks ago, we had Nick Wallenda on the show. We're giving away one of his books. If you've not signed up for the newsletter, you should go do it, jumblethink.com. Simply by signing up, you get entered in to win that book. One listener of JumbleThink is going to win that book, and we're going to send it to you. No cost to you, just directly to you. Then last week, we had 
two amazing conversations. We had Eric and Eliza Roberts on the show. Eric and Eliza are both Hollywood royalty, both incredible actors and actresses. They sat down to share their story, insights into the world of Hollywood, and much, much more. If you missed that, it's a really killer conversation. And then last week, we also talked to Alex Pappas from Hillsong Young and Free. I'm a big fan of their music. I'm a big fan of the Hillsong Church. So it's been an honor to have them on the show to talk about their new album, which came out on Friday. So if you missed that episode, go back and check that out. Beyond that, Jumble Thing continues going on. We have lots of episodes recorded for you. Later in the week, we are talking to Nadav Zemir. He is an educator in Harlem. Uh, and, and they're redefining what high school education can look like. Really fun conversation. I am passionate about the world of education and redefining what it can look like and reimagining it in a modern age, post-COVID, instead of just going back to the status quo, really thinking how we can reinvent this space. An important conversation. And uh, I'm, I'm so excited to be sharing that episode with you later this week. We have some other fun things in store, some other incredible interviews lined up for you in the weeks to come too. Now, in the episode today, I mentioned we are going to be doing questions and answers. These are questions from listeners. They are questions from followers on Quora. They are questions from Twitter. These come from all kinds of places. And they're a wide range of questions. They're not all about ideas and dreams, although all of them are about ideas, maybe not the ideas inside of us, but the ideas that are floating around in culture right now. To kick it off, we're going to look at one of the controversial questions that came in. The question is, why are physical reminders such as statues, monuments, buildings, etc., important for understanding history? I'm going to open this question up in a couple different ways. The first way is simply saying, you know, we look at these monuments, we look at these statues which are being torn down, they are the reminder of the history, not just the good history, not just the history that reinvents what happens in a modern interpretation, but it's a reminder of history as it was in that time. And some of that history is dark. It is not good. It is uh, very hate-filled. And and so ripping down a monument that is directly to, tied to that and putting it somewhere else, I, I get that. I understand that. But on the flip side, if we don't have these monuments of reminding reminding us where we came from, it is easy for history to repeat and it's easy to wash over the history we've had or rewrite it based on our knowledge today and diminish what was going on there. Now, it it is so true that all of us have good history and we have bad history. As a country, we have good history and we have bad history. And it's easy to look back with eyes in a modern world and reinterpret that history and redefine it as something that uh, is conditioned by our understanding today. I I don't know if that's good or bad. I, I really don't. But what I do know is that in that, we don't really learn from history. We're too busy rewriting history. And there's a difference between rewriting history and understanding history so we can rewrite the future. I think so many of us are looking at the past and we are uh, clinging on to what has been, um, whether that's as a victim or whether that is as a person who um, is choosing bad decisions now. We, We take that and we uh, we cling on to this history and we try to rewrite it for today. And instead, what I would propose to you is we need to look at the history, learn from the history and rewrite the future because none of us can fix the past. What we can do is fix the future. We can fix where we're going. We can no longer live where we've been. And so we are writing new history. Every day is history being written. And I think many of us are struggling with how do we reconcile the past and and I, I don't know if we can fully reconcile the past, but what I do know is that we can write a, a new future, and that's what we need to be doing right now. We don't need to look back and try to fix the past. What we need to do is fix the present and move into a future that's so much better. 
We learn from history and we move forward. So that reminder of the past is critical for the foundation for the future. It is so critical for our understanding of where we could go and what could be. And then we get the choice of how we're going to engage and actually do that. And that's kind of my challenge in this is is we need to stop trying to rewrite history. What we need to do is learn from it and, and write a better future, write a more fair future, write a future that brings healing and restoration and brings empowerment and brings hope. And I think so many of us are busy demonizing the past that we're not learning for from it and rewriting, not rewriting, but actually writing a better future. So that's that's part one of that answer of why are physical reminders like statues, monuments, buildings important for understanding history. I want to go a little bit deeper though. I remember a friend of mine saying, you know, are we building monuments? Are we building movements? And sometimes we're so focused on remembering the past, and there's nothing wrong with remembering the past. It is a good thing to do, that we aren't building movements for the future. We are stuck in the past, and we're clinging on to what has been without moving forward. So we've got to, as a culture, begin to build movements and not build monuments. Monuments are absolute. They are permanent. They are steadfast. And there are good things about monuments. There is a stability of them. Movements are ever-changing. They're evolving. They're growing. They're learning. They're rethinking. They're reshaking the ground. They're, they're creating change. They're creating hope. They're creating future. And so for me, I'd much rather create a movement than cling to monuments. And often, whether it's in church or politics or in uh, social justice or other areas, we are building monuments to the past and not building movements towards the future. And so I think that physical reminders are very helpful. They're very healthy because they give us perspective, perspective on how a, a history interpreted itself, how a history thought of itself, and how we can respond for the future as we look and shape what could be. I hope that answer is fair. I hope that that's good. It is one that um, I've wrestled with. I am wrestling with. I'm trying to come up with better answers for. But it's a simple thing of we can't just write off history. It is a part of what was. We can't just simply measure history, the successes and failures, by where we are today. We use it as a foundation to grow, learn, and launch into a better future to say, you know what, that wasn't right. So how do we fix it for the future? Not how do we fix the past? How do we fix where we're going, the trajectory, the, the, the direction? How do we fix that so we create movements and not monuments to the past? That's a hard thing to do. It's a hard thing to wrestle through. But it is important. So history is important. Monuments and statues are important because it gives us a benchmark. It gives us a compass to what has been so we can move forward. And when we move forward, we cling not to monuments, but we create movements of change, hope, love, and compassion. So that's the first question. The second question is more of a business question. It's a fun question. What early stage business decisions are the most vital for an entrepreneur to build a strong business? Great question. I'm going to repeat that again. What early stage business decisions are the most vital for an entrepreneur to build a strong business? I think a couple things. One, we don't talk about it enough, but financials are important. They are the sustainability of our business. And often early stage businesses and entrepreneurs, they take on a lot of debt, a lot of uh, bad deck debt or bad investment into a business that straddles the business with uh, really a, a weight that holds them back. And I would say make good financial decisions early on. I know it's something that I struggled with early on so that you can set yourself up for success. If you have a lot of debt in a business, it's hard to move forward and be successful. If you have a lot of investment that is bad, that it really... Uh, is is hindering the choices and decisions you can make, that's really bad. 
So that's that's tip number one I'd give you. You know, make sure you have good financials. The second tip for early stage business decisions uh, that are vital for an entrepreneur for a strong business is really simple. Make sure you have good vision. Where are you going with this business? What are you offering? And how do you keep that center of why you're doing it? The Simon Sinek thing, of course. You have to keep that vision so that you can have clarity of where you're going. In so many business and so many businesses, I'll say that again, are they're just trying to figure out what's going to work that they lose sense of identity and vision and they end up going nowhere because they're trying to figure it out as they go. It just doesn't work. You need good vision. You need clarity of vision. Uh, There's an old saying that says, without vision, people perish. And the truth of the matter is, is that if you're going to lead a business, you need vision to help people understand where you're going, what your goals are, what your dreams are, and where you are going on this journey. So that would be tip number two on what early stage business decisions help you have a strong business. And tip number three, I'm going to give you one more tip. Get good people around you. That could be an employee. That could be employees. That could be a business coach. That could be other entrepreneurs. Get around good people who can give you insights that you wouldn't see otherwise. My business coach, and I've shared this before, always said, only kings and queens know what kings and queens know. So if you are an entrepreneur, if you are a startup founder, if you are a business owner, get around successful business owners. They might not always have the answer. You might not have the answer yourself. But by having an audience, a crowd of people cheering you on, giving you good insights and correcting you when you need it, you are going to have a strong business. So that is tip number three there. Question number three. Why do we need web designers and developers when we have website building tools like Squarespace, WordPress, Wix, OpenCast, Shopify, and the list goes on? As a web designer and developer for 13 years, I can tell you two things. One, I use all of those tools. I love those tools and they are great tools. And for some people, they can build on those platforms. They are great platforms for them and they can do it on their own. Sometimes if you have a complex website, maybe you want to extend Squarespace beyond what you think is possible. Maybe you want to customize WordPress. Maybe you want to do something unique and different. You need a web designer and developer to help you because they are going to remove the limits that you face because of your experience. Now, some people can overcome that simply by learning and extending their knowledge, and that's awesome. I cheer you on. Go for it. Other people simply don't have the time, the knowledge, the resources, the the energy to do it on their own. And so the resource that they pull in that can do it is a web designer and developer. So that's another reason that's, well, that's the first reason there why um, those tools by themselves don't always work. Sometimes you need something that's completely custom. You couldn't really do a good job of building a social network like Instagram or or Facebook or Twitter on WordPress or Squarespace. You're just not going to do it. And so sometimes when you want to go outside the box, you have to build your own box. And by that, I mean you have to code your own structure instead of using a tool like Wix or WordPress or Squarespace or OpenCast or Shopify or whatever. You need to do something differently than what's available. And that's where a web designer and developer can come in. The other thing about it is that a web designer and developer, a good one, is going to know a lot about user experience. They're going to know a lot about the pitfalls of web design and development. They're going to know a lot of things that you as an individual just going, hey, I'm going to build this in Squarespace may not know. Now, you can still get a great website without a lot of knowledge on Squarespace. I love it. It's awesome. I've helped people build their own websites there. We've built websites for other people there. But having a web designer and developer can be a really big asset because they can help you overcome the hurdles that you don't know you're going to face. They can help you design a website that converts customers, that tells your story more effectively. And by having a professional work with you on this, it sets you up to have a better experience, whether it's on using one of these platforms and having a designer and developer work on those platforms for you or building something custom, they're going to have the knowledge, the skill set, the understanding to get you 
there. Now, I could probably give you a hundred more answers for that, but for now, I think those are two really good answers. Question number four. Are you actually planning a tech startup? No. Okay. That's the first part of the question. Me personally, I'm not. I run uh, the podcast. I run my agency that does uh, high-end development for websites for corporations. I am not personally planning on building a tech startup. Now, I have in the past built startups. I've built startups for other people. I have built startups for myself. Uh, It's just not something I'm doing right now. Nothing wrong with doing it, just not doing it myself. Second part of the question, if so, how are you dealing with the frustration or the feeling that you are spinning your wheels. Now, here's the deal. If you have a dream or idea, if you have a startup idea, if you are building something and you feel like you're just spinning your wheels, there is a big problem going on and you need to resolve that. It is easy to get into the cycles in which you feel stuck and you feel like things aren't working. So you can't live there. And hopefully you can prevent it so you don't live there and that you don't even make the stop at the place where you feel like you're spinning your wheels. How can you do it? I mentioned earlier about vital uh, tips for a strong business. And one of those was to get a coach or a mentor. That is a powerful tool. If you have someone else that knows the road, they're going to help you overcome that stuck in the mud kind of feeling. They're going to give you tools that help you get past it. By having someone that's an advocate, a helper that's going to cheerlead you on, you're going to be able to have success. So that is tip number one. Tip number two, if you are spinning your wheels, either you don't have clarity of vision, so get better vision on what you're creating, what you're doing, who you're serving. Two, reevaluate why your wheels are spinning. I'm not reaching my audience. I feel like I'm stuck on a specific product development issue, figure out what it is that you're spinning your wheels on. I think so often we get into a place where we're stuck, where we are spinning our wheels, that we simply run into a very easy problem to solve. And that's first off, identify the issue. And often when we're in this place of feeling stuck, we're not even identifying the issues. We're just staying stuck. So how do you stop spinning your wheels? Well, figure out what is causing it. And then the second part of that, of course, is to then come up with a plan. If you don't have a plan, you can't move forward. And so if you're spinning your wheels, you identify it. Well, the issue is, is that uh, the specific startup I'm building builds a cog and the cog has a break that causes a a catastrophic failure in the product. Well, then fix the cog. Well, what you need to do at that point is come up with a plan on how you can fix that cog. Oh, we're making it out of plastic. Okay, we'll maybe make it out of metal. Oh, the teeth are too small. They shear off. Okay, we'll make a cog with thicker teeth. You know, come up with a plan and reevaluate, evolve it, and move forward. If it's about reaching people, oh, we're not reaching people. We're not growing fast enough. We're hitting stumbling blocks on this. Well, figure out a plan. Where can you reach your audience? Where do they hang out? Ask that question. What do they need to hear? What do they need to see to listen and like what I do? Solve that problem. Uh, What is it that we can do to get them to engage? Then solve that problem. And sometimes you can't answer those questions. So you need that mentor. You need that coach to come in and say, this is how you do it. And doing it alone is the death march of entrepreneurship. As I say, don't ever do creation, whether it's a dream, idea, startup, alone. Do it with others whether that's employees, coaches, mentors, uh, family, bring those people into the story. When you're stuck, getting that help will get you unstuck. That's question number four. Question number five, how do I start a podcast for free? (laughs) Okay, you start a podcast for free. There there are multiple parts of that question. I'm going to highlight two. Part number one, you need to understand what you're creating. So if you're creating a serial story, create the story. If you're doing interviews, prepare for the interviews. If you're doing standalone episodes like today, plan those. So how do you start with uh, your own free podcast? 
Start with the plan. What am I building? And then start building that show. Come up with a couple episodes. Maybe it's five or 10 that you release from day one. From there, utilize a tool, maybe like Anchor or uh, there are countless tools out there, but Anchor is the first one that comes to mind that you can come in and say, oh yeah, I want to launch a free podcast and Anchor does that. They'll also allow you to monetize early on. Although you won't make a lot of money, you can put ads in those spots. So use Anchor. Then how do you record it so that you can get the idea recorded so you can post it on Anchor? There's a couple of things you can do. You can go out and buy a whole bunch of gear and equipment, but the question is, how do I do it for free? Chances are you have a computer or a phone. That computer or phone or tablet has a microphone built in. Use it. Use it to your benefit to record your episodes. Now, the audio quality will suffer, but it will get you going and it won't cost you anything. Upload that to Anchor and now you have a podcast for free. So three steps to that. One, figure out what you're doing. Two, uh, record it using an iPhone, an Android phone, or computer just using the built-in microphone. You can put the headphones on. You'll get a little bit better quality according to whatever software is there. And then post it to Anchor, all free from start to finish. That is probably the simplest way. There are much more complicated ways that you could do a podcast for free, but that will get you going and get you up. Question number six, how do you prepare for an appearance on a podcast? Two back-to-back questions on podcasting. How cool is that? All right, so I prepare for being interviewed very similarly to how I prepare for having a guest on the show. Now, obviously, instead of researching who I'm interviewing, I am researching the show so I know what to be prepared for. So what what would I do? Number one, I would listen to their show. What is their format? How does it work? What is their pacing like? How long is it? Answer all those questions. What What seems to be their best episode? You could simply ask the person that host that show, hey, can you tell me your three favorite episodes or your three most listened to episodes and go listen to them? You don't have to listen, listen to them. You can skim through them. You could have it on in the background, but take note of the flow, the structure, how it feels. That is the first thing you should do. And if you don't listen to an episode, it's going to be really hard to understand how the show works. So start with that. From there, what I would do is simply ask the host, what is it that makes you feel like the guest is perfect for your show. And they're going to know this is what a good guest is. For us, we like a lot of stories. We don't like a lot of just simple answers. We want to hear the story behind the answer. So that's a great guest for us. We want a person who is captivating, who's done something, whereas some of the guests that can be on a show or pitch us to be on our show um, are people who haven't done much or don't have an area of expertise. They're just coming on to want to talk about whatever they're passionate about. And there's nothing wrong with that. Just not right. The guest, not, not the right guest for us. So from there, I I would simply ask, what is your format and what would make it a good conversation for you? What do you want to hear from me? Ask what that is and then go in prepared. If they want to talk about, like for me, they might hire, uh, have me on their show to, Teach about podcasting. What makes a good podcast? How do you book your guests? How do you do that? Be prepared for those questions. Figure out uh, how to walk through that. I, I watched an interview with Tom Hanks, and he prepares for every interview he does. He does research. He comes up with captivating stories. He prepares those stories. He practices those stories. Go into a show prepared. So if you know you're talking about, let's say, investing in real estate, and you're specifically talking about land real estate, then know all the ins and outs of that. Have some really good tips for the listener. Figure out who that listener is and what they want to hear. A An investor into land that's 20 might be different than a person that has some equity built up and they're willing to invest some money in their 40s or 50s. So approach it by understanding the audience. Approach it by what the, the, the host wants to hear from you and approach it from the stories and the topics and the practical tips that are going to bring value. Cater it around the audience. The audience is the hero and really focus in on crafting the right answers to those questions. Uh, to answer those questions, 
directly to the listener. You're not talking to somebody else. You're talking to that listener. And I think the, the last thing is go into the interview with energy. Go into the interview prepared. Go in with confidence. Have fun. And, and just, you know, listen and then respond. And don't talk on forever. <laughs> that, I think, is our last tip on this. Don't talk forever. We have those guests that just drone on and on and on and on. Uh, have a conversation. Really talk it through and not just go on and on and on, probably like I'm doing right now with that question. So that leads us to question number seven. I think this is going to be our last question for today. I know I, I said 10, but I, I you know, I, I feel like seven is a good number. We're at 30 minutes and I want to make sure we get to some other stuff a little bit later in the conversation. The question is another podcasting question. What are your three to five podcasts for 2020? Well, I'm going to go right over here. I'm going to open my podcast app. And in the podcast app, there are some shows. There's the James Elchicher Show, which is one of my favorite shows. I'm a big fan of James. Hopefully one day we can have him on the show. It would be an honor to have him on. I've been trying to book him for forever, and uh, I, I love his show. He has great guests. He has great insights. He is quirky. Uh, and in that quirkiness, there's a lot of wisdom. Because he thinks so differently than everyone else, I find that super inspiring. I love his show. One you should go check out. There's a show called Conspiracy Theories, which goes deep into conspiracy theories. And, and it looks at it from an analytical standpoint at all the possibilities in whether a conspiracy could be real or is completely bogus. Uh, and I just find it fun. It's entertaining. I don't really buy into a lot of the stories, but you learn some history along the way. And you also get some fun speculation. One of my uh, favorite shows, it's been a favorite show for a long time, is a show called Beyond Bourbon Street. And it is all about New Orleans. It's super fascinating. You get history in it. You get understanding the current culture of New Orleans. You get understanding the businesses of New Orleans. You get in a, a front row seat to all things New Orleans. And it goes beyond, as the title says, Bourbon Street. So it's not just about Mardi Gras. It's not just about Bourbon Street. It's about the culture and the people and the history of that city. It is um, a show that I, I have a lot of respect for. Uh, you should go check that out. LeVar Burton Reads is always fun. LeVar has been on our show. Big fan of what he's creating. He reads fiction stories on their short stories it's just entertaining. It's a great way to sit back and relax. LeVar is a master of story. And uh, so that's another one. So that brings us up to, what, three? I like The Moth. The Moth is just a really fun story telling platform where everyday people go to these events. I don't know if they're doing events so much anymore, but they're telling stories. Uh, and usually they come from story slams where they tell stories and they're short stories. I think they're like around five minutes. Always fun to listen to that and hear that. So that, I think, takes us to four. Uh, so let's see. What is the fifth one that I'm going to recommend? Well, there was one that was called Shh, The Secret, and uh, which sounds kind of weird, but what it's all about is what's called armchair mysteries or armchair hunts where people are trying to solve mysteries from the confines of their chair, and then they get out and they go hunt for it. There's a whole bunch of these games and just a lot of fun. So that's what I am listening to. Hopefully that helps you find a couple new shows that you might like. But that's what I'm listening to and enjoying right now. I'm sure there will be a lot more through 2020 that I'm listening to, and I, I hope to share those with you in the weeks and months to come too. All right, I know I said that that was the last question, but I think I'm going to give you one more question. I hope you enjoy this one. This is the heartbeat of Jumble Think, so I love this question and wanted to make sure that we asked it. What are the best ways to think of ideas for a startup? Okay, I'm going to steal a recommendation from James Altucher, who I mentioned a moment ago, who I'm a big fan of. What are the best ways? Well, he says about a list of 10. So he has a notebook 
I have a notebook too because I've copied his idea. Uh, he does it on a waiter's pad, pad and uh, I do mine in like an old moleskin notebook. But you basically write lists of 10. So you ask a question, what is a great idea for startups? And then you write out 10 things. Oh, um, a cat food delivery company. Okay, well, that's been done. Okay, what's another one? And and what you're not doing is coming with a perfected list. What you're doing is just getting the idea juices flowing. So you're going to spit out a whole bunch of ideas. Uh, 99% of your ideas are going to be horrible or they've been done before or you need to work on clarifying them. There's a bunch of ways you can do that, of course, but you start getting that going. And maybe you ask that same question 10 days in a row. So now you have 100 answers to that question. Maybe instead of 10 answers, you do 20. I think James said this, and if he didn't, then maybe it's something I said, but I'm pretty sure he said this. If the list of 10 is too easy, then you're not either asking a hard enough question or you need to keep on going. So if it's easy at answer 10 and you're just like, oh, fly through it, there's all my 10 answers, uh, then go for 15. And then if 15 are easy, maybe go for 20 and keep pushing that so that you're getting to the part where it actually gets hard and you have to process. You're doing this quick. It doesn't take long to do this. And it's a very, very, very powerful tool for the process of thinking up ideas. Now for testing of those ideas, I like recommending something that I call micro experiments. These are Little activities you can do where it's like the scientific method applied to entrepreneurship and ideas. And you can fly through this. It's simple to do. You just go in and you're like, oh, I'm going to test this idea. So maybe your idea is that cat food idea. And the first thing you do is maybe see, oh, is this a good idea? I, I like this idea. I think it's good. Is there a market for it? Maybe you run a Facebook or Google ad campaign for a week and you just spend $10, you create a couple ads and you post them and you see how many people are clicking on this. Okay, well, 100 people saw this. Out of those 100 people, 50 people clicked on this. They got to a little landing page website I built. You could use Squarespace and you just do, hey, welcome, we're getting ready to launch this cat food delivery company and we want to know if you want a free month or give them an offer or something like that to opt into you uh, can capture their information. And now, not only have they clicked on the ad, they've seen it, they clicked, now they've engaged with it. And you can see, you know, how many people are interested, how many people are serious in their interest. And you can build that list out. And if the idea is good, you can reuse that. There's a whole process for micro experiments that I've created that you can find on jumblethink.com. It's a, a free guide. You'll see it pop up in the bottom right corner. You can download that there completely free. And I'd love for you to go check that out. But those are some of the best ways to think of ideas for startups. Make it fun. Make it easy. Do those list of 10. I think James is on to something. I think he's completely right. That is the best way for that. All right. So those are our eight questions today. We were going to do 10, but we had eight. We're going to take a break right here. And when we come back, well, we're going to give you a little bit more of an update. Hey there, friends. I have a quick question for you. Can you help me out? I want to create a better show for you. I want JumbleThink to be about you. I want it to be something that inspires you, challenges you, helps you on this journey of chasing dreams and ideas and really becoming the fullness of who you're created to be. But to do that, I need to hear from you, whether it's dropping us a note on Facebook, LinkedIn, or Instagram, or going to the website jumblethink.com and dropping us a note. Let us know what you thought of today's show, what you you think of JumbleThink as a whole, your favorite episode, your least favorite conversations, things you don't like about the show, what kind of guests you'd like to see. I would like to hear from you so that we can create a better show that serves as a catalyst, as a spark to get you to turn those dreams and ideas into reality. So head on over to any of those points that you like to connect on. Drop us that note. Let us know what you want to hear, what you want to see, and what would make Jumble think better for you. Now let's return to today's conversation. Levez seulement le bras pour mettre l'aiguille sur le disque. Mettez le contact. Reposez votre bras.
We are back and just about ready to wrap up today's conversation. I wanted to remind you later this week, we are talking to Nadav Zamir. He is a principal at a a high school in Harlem, New York, but they're not just doing the status quo high school curriculum. They're actually doing some really innovative, creative things to help inspire people. This is a conversation you want to make sure to check out. That's going to be on our next show of Jumbo Think. And then beyond that, we have lots of guests. I have my sticky notes with me that are usually on my wall, and we've got a good 20 guests lined up for you. I'm going to keep it a secret, but we've got a great show lined up for you soon with some amazing people. As we wrap up this show, I thought it would be kind of fun to do something very different. It's something that I I can't remember if I've ever done it on the show, to be honest. And that's simply to tell you a little bit more about me. I know that some of you have listened and you've heard our guests You've heard the conversations, maybe you even heard some of these topical episodes like today's episode, but you don't often hear me talk about who I am and my, my family and likes and dislikes, and, and, and maybe you, you, you simply don't care and that's fine. But some of you may be going, I, I want to feel like I know you a little bit more. So I thought I would answer a couple questions since these are our kind of question of the day pulling some of the best questions, some of the most asked questions today earlier with our eight questions, I thought I would answer a few questions about me. The first question is, can you tell us a little bit about your family? I would love to. I am married. My wife's name is Jennifer. We've been married for several years now. We have two kids, Lucy, who's seven, and Lily, who is three. They are awesome. I'm missing them a lot here while I'm in California on this wildfire stuff. And they're just incredible. We homeschool. We love homeschooling. Nothing wrong with the public school system. We are big fans of it. But we've been homeschooling for the last couple of years. It's just right for our family. And our daughters love it. And that makes it even better. Uh, we're big fans of education and rethinking education for a better future. So whether that's homeschooling, whether that's coming up with new systems, as a family, we love that. Our daughters love to learn, which inspires us to continue learning as adults. They're amazing and a lot of fun. Lucy um, is just the sweetest person, and Lily is our little adventurer. She likes to climb things she shouldn't climb, get into things that she shouldn't get into, but she loves adventure, and she is probably the most extroverted person I've ever met in my life, uh, but she loves well. She loves people so much, and they're just incredible. My wife works for a clothing company to help people find what clothes work best for them, and she works from home. And I, of course, own a web agency, and we do some other fun things, and it's just a lot of fun. We have a great family. They inspire me every day. I miss them so much while I'm here I can't wait to see them again. All right, so that's a little bit about my family and uh, just incredible people. Hopefully you get to meet them, hear them on the show sometime in the future because they are way cooler than I am uh, and they're just pretty amazing. So question number two, what kind of things are you into? All right, great question. Thanks for asking. I love doing things that uh, push the boundaries of what I'm comfortable with. But not like in extreme sports kind of way. Like I'm not jumping on a plane. I have done the rock climbing thing and all that kind of stuff. But doing fun adventures. So uh, in building things. So I um, am getting ready to build a dining room table kind of in a farmhouse style. So I'm excited about that. I am and have been working on building guitars. Built some pedal boards for guitars. Um, a bunch of stuff like that. I love barbecuing. I have a brand new pellet grill from a company called A Smoke and loving that small but mighty is that grill and uh, cooking some baby back ribs that are yummy and uh, hopefully I get to share those with you someday who are listening. Uh, Come on over. We'll grill up something juicy and amazing sometime. I enjoy learning. I enjoy exploring and understanding. And it could be around a broad group of 
subjects. It could be how do you make root beer? I'd love to learn about that. How to learn how to be a better jazz guitar player. Working on that one. That one is a hard one. I love learning about history. I love learning about places. I love exploring. All of those things are so much fun to me. So those are some of the things I love doing. I love woodworking. I love uh, spending time with my family. I love going for runs. I used to run a lot. I need to run more again, but I love running. So those are some of the things I love to do. All right. So that leads to question number three. Who are your dream guests? Now, I have an actual notebook. I It started out, I did a bucket list book. I have that sitting here. And I'll talk about that in a second because there's another question about that. But beyond that, I have a second notebook, and that is my dream guest. There are 99 guests on the list right now. That's growing. I've had a whole bunch of them on the show. You can find that at jumblethink.com slash dreamguests. That list is right there, and it will grow and change. I've had like Erwin McManus on there, dream guest. I have Bill Sheft from uh, Letterman Show, uh, dream guest. I had Phil Rosenthal and LeVar Burton on. I've had a lot of people on here that are from this list. But two of my top favorite people I want to have on the show that I haven't booked yet, David Letterman and Carson Daly. Both of them are incredible at what they do and create, and I would love to have them on the show. I'd love to have Tony Bennett on the show. How cool would that be? I'd love to have Josh Schwartz on the show. He created my favorite TV show of all time called Chuck. And I'd love to have him on the show. I would love to have um, someone like Michael J. Fox on the show or James Taylor or uh, Lance Armstrong or Steve Martin or, like I mentioned before, James Elchicher. There's a whole list of people here that I would love to have on the show. So you can definitely check that out at jumblethink.com slash dreamguest. Those are a couple of my favorite on the list, which leads me to the next question. I heard you had a bucket list. Can you tell me a little bit more about how that started? Great question. All right. So years ago, when I was working at a church in Northern California called the Father's House, we had a guy named Ed Cotney, who was kind of the administrative pastor who oversaw operations and helped us create vision. Super cool. And one day he said, I want you to create a, 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 a vision board for the next five years. I want you to put down a couple of things. What do you want to accomplish? Where do you see your life? What are the things that were uh, things you want to accomplish? And, and early on there on that list, one of them was to uh, climb Mount Lassen, which I've done. That was really cool. Another one was to go see John Marin concert, which is item number 28 on the, the most recent bucket list. That's been done. I got to see him a couple of years ago. Um, I didn't do it in the five years like I had planned when I did the list. I think it was probably more like 12 years, but that's on there. There are currently 420 things on the paper list, which isn't really accurate because there's a lot of things that are kind of scribbled out. Maybe it was a duplicate entry or something like that. But you can check that out on the website too if you go to jumblethink.com slash bucket dash list. And officially there's 110 items on that list and 91 of those have been accomplished. Oh, by the way, if you're wondering about the dream guests, 99 people on that list, 25 of those people have been on the show. So what is the big dream thing that I want to accomplish this year? Great question. Well, I want to finish the acoustic guitar build that I worked on years ago and never had happen. I'd like to lose weight again and keep it off. That's on the bucket list. I would like to launch idea camps. So those are three of the big ones that I want to do in 2020, 2021. I'll keep you posted on that. Hopefully I'll be able to post that picture of that acoustic guitar that I built from raw wood with my own hands. How cool would that be? But I bring up the bucket list and that question because If you are a dreamer, idea maker, and you haven't started writing down your dreams, that's my big tip for you today as we wrap up today's show. Dreams and ideas only happen when you put action to the dream. Dreams by themselves aren't all that valuable without action. And so 
a simple thing you can do is start creating that list. We talked about lists of 10 earlier in the show with James Elkacher uh, and his tip about the list of 10. Uh, and that's my challenge to you today. Get a little notebook, like a little moleskin book or get a pen and paper, maybe a little legal pad, whatever it is for you, and start writing down a list. Maybe it's a bucket list. Maybe it's 10 things you want to accomplish in 2021. Maybe it's um, creating a list of 410 items like I have on things I want to accomplish over my lifetime. But take some time to dream a little bit. Take some time to figure out what is it that I want to do. Start coming up with those concepts. Start writing down those dreams. Start crafting the story you want to tell. That's my challenge for you today. You know, I've shared some answers to your questions. I've answered some things about me in today's show. And now I leave it with a question for you. What would your life look like if you took the risk to step out in faith and create the thing that is burning inside of you? It could be an idea. It could be a dream. It could be something that you just really want to accomplish. But what would your life look like? How would it change your life if you saw that become a reality? Is it something that you think would make your life better? Is it something that would open up new possibilities? I hope it is. And if it is, then why aren't you doing it? Why aren't you stepping out? Why aren't you taking the risk? Well, I hope you will take time today to pull out that notebook, start putting pen to paper, and then start moving forward with those dreams and ideas. Start creating, start checking things off those lists. Start dreaming bigger than you could have ever imagined. I can't create your dreams for you. I can't turn your ideas into reality. I could copy your ideas. I could make them my own. But what's the purpose in that? So that's my challenge today. Would you take some time to dream a little bit, to write it down, to begin the journey of creating those dreams, turning those ideas into reality? I believe that you are created for something awesome, that your dreams and ideas matter. That's why I created Jumble Thing. That's why I'm here, because I believe in you. I believe that you have a destiny that is worth living, that is worth doing, that is worth creating. But many of us choose never to do that. And I hope today, maybe today's conversation, maybe one of our interviews, maybe one of the stories you've heard from me or a guest can be a spark, can be a catalyst for turning those dreams and ideas into reality. I have a simple dream. And hopefully Drumble Think is helping to make that a reality. And that simple dream is to help people step out of the known and into the unknown to create the things they're called to do. That's my hope. So what will you do today? What will you do to chase those dreams and ideas? Thanks for tuning in to today's show. It means the world to me that you would listen. I hope it's inspired you on this journey. I want to thank our friends over at Floxy for sponsoring today's show. Floxy can help you with web design, graphic design, and even video editing for all of your projects. Best of all, they want to give you 10% off your first month. All you have to do is head on over to Floxy, F-L-O-C-K-S-Y dot com slash jumblethink to get that 10% off. So go do that right now and start getting the design, the development, and the videos that you dream about getting. Now it's your turn. Get out there, dream big, and change the world around you. Cherchez la meilleure position. Les bras et les jambes. Légèrement espacé. Étirez-vous doucement, mais complètement. En avant, en arrière, sur les côtés. Vous êtes une autre personne. Mères de famille, les enfants peuvent également prendre un moment revitalisant dans quelques mois lorsque vous aurez bien saisi la technique et que vous serez maître de votre corps, vous pourrez vous décontracter même en travaillant.